Thank you very much. Okay, so I'm presenting the Falial Fallopian Tube. Um, <laughs> funny enough, Superlele sent me a message asking what does fallible mean. And I'm like, um, it's an English word, look it up in a dictionary. <laughs> but hopefully, um, after this presentation, you will understand. <laughs> Um, so, infertility is a growing concern. Um, approximately 85% of healthy young women or couples conceive within one year of trying and coital frequency is positively correlated with pregnancy rates. However, 10 to 15% of couples have difficulty conceiving and experience infertility or, infertility or subfertility. Infertility is defined as the inability to conceive after one year of unprotected intercourse without contraception. Um, there are two types of infertility. We have primary infertility, where the couple has never produced a pregnancy, and secondary infertility, where a woman has previously been pregnant regardless of the outcome and is now unable to conceive. Um, this is a pie chart just depicting um, the etiology of tubal fat, oh, uh, uh, basically the etiology of um, infertility. Among infertile couples, male infertility accounts for 35% and female infertility accounts for 65%. Dysfunction caused by tubal fat infertility is the most common cause of female infertility and the focus of, and, and the focus of this presentation. The diagnosis of tubal fat infertility can be established by a combination of clinical suspicion based on patient history and confirmed with diagnostic tests. So the tubal factor. Um, tubal disease due, due to, oh, sorry. <clears throat> I think you were being unfair to women <laughs> by including unexplained on the female side. <laughs> uh, possibly. <laughs> um, okay, sorry. Okay, so tubal disease due to the occlusion and peritoneal pathology causing, causing adhesions is the most common cause of female infertility and diagnosed in 30 to 35 percent of infertile women. The most prevalent cause is PID and acute salpingitis, um, chlamydia trichomonas and Neisseria gonorrhea and anaerobic organisms are the most common organisms that infect the lower GIT tract, with chlamydia being the major causative infection. In studies of women diagnosed with PID, the risk of an inf infertility increased with the number of and severity of pelvic infections, with uh, one PID episode being 12% uh, of a risk and at 54% um, when there have been three episodes of um, PID. Ruptured appendix also increases it by five times and in about 50 other causes are obviously endometriosis, previous tubal surgery, pelvic adhesions, and congenital anomalies of the tubes. There is no identifiable risk in about 50% of patients with documented tubal factor infertility. Um, so this slide just depicts um, current, currently the prevalence in developing countries. The real prevalence of PID is unknown and since, since so many women are either asymptomatic or have atypical symptoms. Since PID has obstetric, gynecological and contraception related causes, its prevalence is quite high. About 70% of PID admissions on the sub-Saharan Africa are a result of reproductive infections. Um, while this figure is about 34% in Asia and about 31% in the developed countries. Only about 10 to 20% of lower respiratory, uh, reproductive tract infections ascend into the upper genital tract, and even a smaller percentage of women with PID develop chronic sequelae, but only requires one episode. Um, this tube, this diagram just shows 
infection related tubal disease. This is a, pic of, a picture of severe tubal damage and it also lowers ovarian reserve. Tubal damage with PID causes long term tubal changes such as fimbrial agglutination and phimosis, tubal obstruction and hydrosalpings. Endometriosis is a common and chronic inflammatory disorder and accounts for 7 to 14 percent of tubal fat infertility. Among women with infertility, pelvic pain or both, it is present in 35 to 50 percent. Long-term consequence of chronic inflammation is often distal tubal adhesive disease and occlusion. We're just moving on to the assessment of tubal disease. Um, so, hysterosalpingogram is the most commonly performed test for tubal patency. It is an outpatient radiographic procedure and is ideally performed two to five days immediately after the menses to prevent the chance that the procedure may be performed after conception and to minimize the risk of infection. Although laparoscopy and chromoperturbation is the gold standard for investigating tubal patency, HSG has moderates. HSG has moderate sensitivity and excellent specificity in the inf infertile population. Um, however, if HSG indicates occlusion, there's a 60% chance that the tubes are patent. And if it demonstrates patency, there's a 5% chance the tubes will be occluded. Other advantages of HSG is that it's relatively cheap and simple. It's a less invasive way of examining the tubal patency. And aside from being faster and less expensive than laparoscopy, it can delineate the contours of the uterine cavity and the lumen of the fallopian tube. Incidentally, um, HSG has also been shown to increase fertility in the months immediately after the procedure in women with patent tubes. And it enhances infertility, uh, sorry, it enhances fertility by mechanical lavage, simulation of the tubal cilia, and inhibition of hostile peritoneal fluid immune cells. Disadvantages of HSG, um, the pelvis is exposed to radiation, which can be a significant problem in pregnancy. Um, it causes abdominal pain, which peaks at five minutes. You have a risk of intravasation. Um, and obviously, early detection minimizes complications. Any evidence of intravasation um, should lead to immediate discontinuation of HSG. False occlusion occurs in 12.5% and there's false patency as well. In, there's a high risk or high incidence of false corneal, uh, corneal obstruction and two separate tubal studies should be performed before diagnosis of proximal tubal obstruction is confirmed. Contraindications, we've discussed it, possible pregnancy, history of acute PID, you should delay HSG for several weeks and relatively if there's history of suggestions of PID, recent uterine instrumentation and IOD and allergy. The risk for PID after H SG uh, on average is about 1.4% of women um, and for that matter all patients undergoing HSG should be covered with prophylactic antibiotics. It should be doxycycline mainly to co cover for chlamydia trichomonas and it should be commenced one to two days before the procedure. So we don't do this, um, I don't think we do. <laughs> But sonohysterosalpingogram is also an effective alternative to HSG. It is an ultrasound-based um, imaging modality that permits an accurate evaluation of the tubal patency and uterine and ovarian pathology. It has a 76% 76 correlation, 76 correlation uh, rate with laparoscopic chromoperturbation. And the use of three-dimensional imaging and Doppler to highlight fluid movement through the fallopian tubes can improve the diagnostic capabilities. Um, experience, however, is very important. The advantages of... Um, sorry. There are several advantages of SHG. It is fast and low-cost. It's formed in an outpatient setting 
there's no radiation, no anesthesia, um, and it's said to be better tolerated than HSG and post-procedural complications are rare. Um, however, there was a review, current methods of tubal patency assessment, um, and it was basically to evaluate the scientific literature on current methods of uterine cavity and tubal patency assessment, mainly focused on hysterosalpingogram, um, and it showed that it is comprehensive, less invasive, time efficient, but the val val validity is questionable, and as you will see uh, coming up, it's not better than HSG. Um, this is just a table showing screen, uh, screening tests for tubal pathology judged against laparoscopic findings and laparoscopic is um, the gold standard. So HSG and hysterosalpingogram, uh, HSG specificity and sensitivity is better. Um, whereas these chlamydial, sorry, the role of chlamydia antibodies um, in the evaluation of infertile women has not been clearly defined and these serological tests may be more suitable as screening tests warranting further investigation. So, laparoscopy is the gold standard to treat and is indicated in abnormal HSG and if there is a high suspicion or diagnosis of tubal disease. Um, laparoscopy with chromatin, oh, sorry, um, the diagnosis of tubal patency is better than HSG because there is a, there's less observer variability. Um, other considerations with laparoscopy. So if there's normal HSG or no history suggestion of tu a tubal disease, it is not really justified um, or cost effective to perform laparoscopy. However, it may reveal mild or minimal endometriosis or peritubal adhesions. And it also may be indicated if surgery or medical treatment has not been proven to improve fecundity. But however, with the current success rates of ART and the relatively low contribution of diagnostic laparoscope to decision making of treating patients with normal HSG, uh, laparoscopic investigation should not be omit should not be omitted in couples with unexplained infertility. The advantages laparoscopic provides a panoramic view of the abdomen and pelvis and allows the ability to diagnose and treat various pathologies, including distal tubal occlusion, endometriosis, and anexal and pelvic adhesions. Um, if there's correct timing, it can enable ev evidence of ovulation, there's no exposure to radiation, and it can com be com combined with salpingoscopy and hysteroscopy. Um, disadvantages that it requires GA and there's a small risk of visceral damage. So this is um, the revised American Society for Reproductive Medicine classification developed a standardized classification for me mechanical problems associated with infertility. And the schemes are relatively simple to follow and a scoring system is included to help the surgeon document the se severity and formulate a prognosis based on the extent of the pathology. It is used for adnexal adhesions, distal tubal occlusions and endometriosis and is based on laparoscopic findings and provides a rational foundation for therapy. So this is just a mock-up um, and they basically give you pictures of, this is of endometriosis and then this is a table or a document that needs to be filled in and it correlates with the grading and with future pregnancy rates. So the management, what is the evidence for tubal surgery, IVF and expectant management? Assisted reproductive technologies have improved over the last decades almost all for almost all causes of infertility, especially tubal factor infertility have been treated through um, ART. The results of IVF ET, um, 
embryo transfer and tubal surgery are difficult to compare because of the many variable results. A Cochrane, um, Cochrane analysis concluded that the success of tubal surgery versus IVF remains largely unknown. And it, largely unknown. And in the treatment of women with tubal fat infertility, there are no randomized control studies. So this is the classified. Sorry. With regards to surgery, tubal surgery to overcome infertility. Um, caused by tubal disease is popular and in part because of the risks and in part because of the risks and costs related to IVF. Microsurgical techniques can restore fallopian tube anatomy and function in tubal disease. The Hall and Rutherford classification system is a simple system that is able to distinguish women into three distinct groups giving a favorable, fair, and poor prognosis for the live birth following tubal surgery. So this is just a mock-up of the classification. Um, this is the Cochrane Review for Techniques for Pelvic Surgery in Subfertility. And from these limited data, there is no evidence or benefits or of disad or disadvantages of tubal surgery versus no treatment or alternate treatments. Um, likewise, there is no evidence of, of advantage or disadvantage using microsurgery, CO2 laser, electrocoagulation, or thermoregulation, uh, thermocoagulation. Randomized controlled trials should be undertaken to determine the role of tru tubal surgery versus no treatments or alternate treatments um, and should be undertaken to determine the role of tubal surgery, laparoscopic or laser electrocoagulation. Why not IVF? Um, so is IVF... The question, why not IVF, is IVF available and is it affordable? When a couple is deciding on between IVF and tubal surgery, the advantages and disadvantages of both should be discussed. The advantages of in vitro fertilization, embryo transfer, transfer are good per cycle success rate, there's less surgical invasiveness, and attempts at conceiving can start immediately. However, the disadvantages are a risk of multiple pregnancy, ovarian hyperstimulation, and high costs. However, IVF should be the initial choice, uh, initial treatment of choice. It is the main player for treatment of tubal fat infertility, and it is always initially indicated in moderate to severe tubal disease, sperm dysfunction, and endometriosis. <coughs> This is just a table to compare IVF and surgical techniques. So IVF has a higher, uh, low birth rate, sorry, 37 to 40% in women less than 35. And with surgery, it varies. It's more expensive. It's inaccessible. You have a risk of um, ovarian stimulation, multiple pregnancies, ectopic pregnancy, and psychosocial. Um, whereas surgery is more cost analysis impossible, uh, cost analysis effective, intra-op complications may occur, ectopic pregnancy is higher, but there's no risk of ovarian hyperstimulation, and it requires expertise. What is expectant management, and should we be doing that? Um, so surgery for tubal infertility, there was a review and it basically surmised that any effect of tubal surgery relative to expectant management IVF in terms of live birth rates for women and tubal infertility remains unknown. And large trials need to be, or randomized trials need to be um, established. <coughs> So surgery, tubal surgery prior to IVF. Um, numerous studies have shown that hydrosalpinges have a negative effect on pregnancy and IVF success rates. Women with hydrosalpings have half the pregnancy implantation and delivery rates 
and up to twice the inf incidence of, a, um, of spontaneous abortions after IVF and embryo transfer. Current practice is salpingectomy and proximal tubal occlusion um, are recommended for the treatment of hydrosalpings. This was just a review on surgical treatment for tubal disease in women undergoing in vitro fertilization and the sum was that surgical treatment should be considered in all women with hydrosalpins prior to IVF treatment. Thank you. Oh, no, uh, oh, that's that one. She, she's done. still recovered. <laughs> uh, I think it was well done. It's just that she, I'm not sure it's not your first presentation. No. <laughs> yes. But she keeps sighing and breathing. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Maybe the heat. Can you go back to the first slide? I, I think there are just a few take home messages before we open the, the presentation to the floor. When we say, I mean, tumor disease is a very common in our setting, uh, make no mistake. So the question is, do we have any randomized control trials to at least motivate our reasons to treat these women? There are no RCTs. Whatever evidence we get out there is based on observational studies or comparable non-randomized control trials. So I think given that, the question is, what do you do in your setting? So one, if you look at the map, the question was this follow-up fallopian tubes. I think in our, I won't say development, that nomenclature is long gone. I'll say low and middle income countries. Your tubal pathology is in the region of 60%, if not more. And if you look at the first slide where she spoke about primary and secondary infertility, I think that information is useful to be able to triage or to expect what you're going to do. Primary fertility in largely ovarian diseases that you're going to encounter. In the second infertility group, it's mainly tumor disease. These women have proved to be pregnant before, but subsequently the, the, the tubes have done them some sort of injustice. So you can go look at your clinic from day to day. Once you hear secondary infertility, think of tumor disease, because you will find it. And then the history will make you suspect it. And of course, how do you going to look for it? And I think the next slide was on this one. I think that, that, that without wasting time with the slide, the question that always we ask in the clinic is when is HSG indicated and when would you do a laparoscopy? For me, it's simple. You want to profile your patient. If you think this is a low risk patient, there is no history suggestive of pelvic inflammatory disease, no pelvic surgery. Four, there is no history of chronic pelvic pain or any dysmenorrhea, and they've been trying for a year or two. That's a candidate for a hysterosalpingo. You're going to screw it. But if you have a high risk patient, the history is glaring to say pelvic surgery before, admitted for PIDs, you have evidence of a history of chronic pelvic pain, suggestive of endometriosis, you do an ultrasound, you look at pathology suggestive of next and nexus. That's an indication for the person. You're going to waste your time for that woman to go to distress of program, then later come back for the person. So you're going to triage which one is a low risk who will benefit from the distress of program. Which one is a high risk that we say, Madam, let's go to a laparoscopy because we can treat at the same time. So I think that that, that was primarily the key message from your follow-up tubes. When do you suspect these tubes are followable? The history will tell you either be primary or secondary or the inquiry that you want to take from the patient. And two, after you have that profile, is it a low risk or is it a high risk? Level? How are you going to screen this person? In terms of treatment, it's always going to be on settings based. What you have, what you don't have. I think many of the patients now have access, that's why we come late to the meeting, because the clinic is better. Everyone now realizes we have, have somehow a hope to do IVF, but it's the most effective treatment. The question is, can they afford it? Is it accessible? Because we know, if you go on this slide where you saw Halebaro, yeah. I think that the question is, when is surgery going to be 
indicated and when you want to do IVF. And I said there are no randomized controls. In the absence of robust evidence, what is going to guide your treatment? And truth be said, it's going to be what the settings have, the experience you have in the unit, what the patient value and prefer as a mode of treatment, and what they can afford, the available resources. I mean, you look at the Harlem uh, the grade one tubes are the ones that everyone will go for. But the, once you come to grade two and grade three, if you go to high income countries, those tubes are going to go to from the beginning and they go for IV. But we still fit it with those tubes, grade two, grade three. And I think the message I want to bring out here, once you have the tubes two and three, you have to talk to the patient. You look at the age, are there any other coexisting pathology for infertility? but be at least guideful to that company. Because many of them will say, I saw Dr. Chris, I saw Prof. Bota, I saw so and so. They say they open the tubes. And by the time they come to the effective treatment, they are 40, 40 plus. Then it's poor outcomes from the way go. So I think you can tell them when they're 27, 28, that these tubes are not removed at least a year. If you do not conceive, go for IVF. But to give building this hope that let's fix these tubes, let's fix these tubes. They see, they disappear, they never come back. But I think grade two, grade three, you can at least amend first time. A repeat surgery, the outcome is generally poor. But if you have resources, two and three, most of these patients tubes will be removed and they'll go for IV. But because of no access, expensive cost, they'll say, no, can I just try and do two or plus? And you tell them at least a year, that's the time we give them. If you're not pregnant in a year, consider IVF. The question is, can they access it? I think the questions are, are open to this. <laughs> <laughs> Tabo, I just want to know, is it better to remove the tube? I think Lucy did talk a little bit about that, or to occlude the tube, and if you're going to occlude it, where, where do you do it? <laughs> oh, I feel yeah. it's a question for you. I think if the decision to remove the tube, yes, preferably we want to remove the tube. And I, I have my reasons, and there's no evidence for it. Simply because if you have hydrosalpages, so some people say just drain it and just occlude the tube. Simply because you don't want to go and fit it with the tube next to the ovary and potentially compromise the ovarian supply to that over. But the truth is, if you are meticulous, as you would have tried to be in the olden days like hoping, the sediment die, you keep crapping and crapping until you get a good plane between the over and the tube. I think tube of salpingectomy for me is the first part. Simply because you can include the tube and we say at the proximal end where the tube leaves the, the uterus. And every time you go scan, even during IVF, you still see this reaccumulation of fluid, and it's just a sore eye to you as a thing, even if you know those tubes are, are, are blocked. Some patients have still complain that yes, it has some discomfort because it's a solid tube. Intercourse is not possible, there's always that problem. If you can, aim for self injection, but be aware you're not going to compromise the, the ovarian uh, supply. If it's impossible, it's the abdomen, you don't want to go in it. PID, multiples, or TB before, then you may consider hysteroscopic occlusion used by the shoe. You just go with the hysteroscopy and you put the cord in the tubes, then you don't have to go into that. It's an option. Cordy. I think we should, we're not, <coughs> we're a third world country. We must remember that most of our patients can't afford IVF. So at least if you do salpingostomy, you open the tubes, the success rate of that leading to a pregnancy is quite low, but at least it does help. And I think the big advantage is you don't remove the blood supply to the ovaries. That's the one big advantage. And if you do a proper salpingostomy, you also drain the tubes. Uh, the, uh, you don't have the contents of the tubes that run and uh, impair uh, embryo implant, implantation. So that's a group that we mustn't uh, forget. And then, if the cause of infertility is endometriosis, the tube ins inside itself is not uh, 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 damaged. 
you'll find that it's occluded and then those that they do better with or there's a better chance than the person who has had a, a previous infection for a spontaneous pregnancy after psychoclostomy. So I don't think we must forget that. I think if you, you get the message. I think that there, there are two things for COVID. There are two points that, that COVID made. One is that can you try and can I <laughs> you try and, and salvage the truth as possible as you can. And I, I think we completely agree with that. Because when you see the patient, you first look at the effective treatment. And, and we never use the word the best treatment. Because what is best to you might not be best to me. So all you talk to the patient is it effective, based on evidence. And if there's no evidence, the second question you're going to ask, is it at least, is it at least going to be safe? And can I afford it? And I think you have to go through that meal with the person. At the end of the day, the person is going to decide. And I think the mistake we made, and I agree with COVID, the mistake we made is that we want to be paternalistic to the patient and say, no, you have blood tubes, we don't think you can afford IVF. Go for, for tubal surgery. And they sit on that room for years with that hope that these tubes are going to deliver a miracle for them. And I want to say, you can do your best to try and fix the tube. If it's not going to deliver, it will never deliver. So I agree with Kobe that give the tube the best chance, but counsel the patient properly that we've done at least some justice to this tube. If it's not giving you what you need, remove the tube. You, you, that, that's a message you must get out of this. Yes, give it a chance, but if it's not delivering, don't sit on it and hoping that one day it will do a miracle. And I think the question that, again, the copy brought is the, the technique of doing something gospel. That, again, is also important. When you open the tube, you put a stitch around the tube to leave it patent for long, or you just open it and bend on the edges. Those also contribute to the success of your salping gospel. And that is also expertise dependent. So you have to have the expertise on how you're going to amend or at least salvage this tube. For endometriosis, I do, there's no doubt. Whenever there's tubal occlusion in the endometriosis, we target the endometriosis. We leave the tubes. It's not in our interest to remove the tube for endometriosis, but you remove the source, which is the endometriosis. Yes, I'm saying we are um, in theater with a laparoscopy and we find bilateral tubular um, affectation or hydrosol pills on both sides. Would you um, advise us to do a, obviously with the patient's consent and beforehand, but to do a, a self injecting on the one side and then say it's not financially feasible at the moment to do IVF, to do a self injecting on one side to remove the that uh, toxic fluid on the one side and then do a self-costume on the other side. Okay. So <laughs> it, it goes back to a classification yeah, yeah. again. As a, okay, if you say yeah. this is a grade 3 tube, okay, and yeah. truth be said, there are those tubes that you see, these tubes are completely out. But the concern would have been predetermined. The person by the time she went to theater, she told you, I cannot afford, don't take them out. So all you do is to open them, both and then come. She, it would be very difficult for you to, to say, I'll open the other and remove the other. We will do as we were instructed by the patient, understanding the potential outcome of that surgery, whether they can afford an alternative in IVF. If they cannot, then they will tell our front, we cannot try and open my tubes and leave them. And you will do as you instructed. When you go back, you tell them, this is what we did and this is what you expect out of the surgery. If it's 1%, it's 1% what it is. But I think the key there is that you always have that in the back of your mind. Even in the bigger scale of things, the health system cannot be able to absorb all these shocks that we create. We will do the surgery today. She goes home. She's back and forth from work trying to get this child. Next thing, she needs another surgery because the tubes are blocked. And if you look at the cost, it's a huge cost, but no one ever put it in black and white. How much does the actual health system bleed by trying to delay the effective treatment when you could have offered them an alternative that works? So you will do as you instructed. 
If they are both there, you tell them, this is what you think you should do. Can you afford IVF? If the answer is no, open the tubes and give the message. If you are told, I can afford IVF, do what you think is effective and in the best interest of the In your patient who has grade 3 disease and who can't afford IVF, do you raise the issue of adoption? Because that's even more effective. <laughs> And that, what I see is people delay that for 10 years and then they, then it's actually effectively too late. Uh, thank you for that. It's, a, it's an ethical question which is loaded with the order of ethical discussion. <laughs> but if it does a trajectory, we have to take it, we'll take it. But I think that, that the question as a, when you counsel a person for, for treatment, you include all options we do. We do from what they can do on their own, whether you want to include the third party. And the third party would either be outsourcing the eggs, outsourcing the sperm, or to a point where they need to adopt the child. And at the end, to a point where they are happy to be childless. And say, no, I don't want any people who has to come and bug me. I'm happy not to have children. So we will discuss all those options. And eventually, it, it sort of becomes like a path or a journey that they walk, where they say, no, I want to give everything before. I but that discussion of adoption of childlessness is always factored in the options that we discuss with the patient. But the, the, the question that, that, that for Paul brought is, is where all of us must try and work around that kind of a platform. That what is effective might not necessarily be what I want. That there's values and preferences and you realize in any form of research that you're going to do now, no ethical committee will approve your last trial if you did not involve the community or the society and they say, we value this research, or there is value and preferences in this research, this is what we want. It might not just be what we trust, but we think this is important, let's do this research. If the community say no, we're not interested. We might not get an approval. So at the end of the day, whenever you now think structural in terms of research, the question is, how is the community going to benefit? Is there value and preferences in this? So you always have to bring all. And I'm very proud of the issue of the adoption is effective, but it might not be able to come um, can I make one last comment? Um, I um, was involved in a study f uh, a few years ago, it's called the Every Study, where we looked at young women between the ages of 16 and 24 years old. Um, we worked out of Kraafentein um, Day Hospital, and we served that area of Kraafentein and Kukumbos, looking at the risk for um, HIV transmission um, after an HPV vaccine, but the chlamydia rates was enormous, um, and there were only one, some very few st studies in the world published on um, similar um, high HIV, um, chlamydia rates, and the one was from South Africa, um, and we're busy working on that data now, but it, it, it's it, in that particular group, 30% of them tested somewhere in that four years positive for chlamydia. So, I think chlamydia is an epidemic that's completely underestimated because we don't test for it. Um, and I think a lot of what we see in, in your clinic is the result of, of chlamydia that's not treated effectively. That's no, true. That is very true. Uh, the, the key question that subsequent to what uh, Burton brought is that it, do you need to go and confirm chlamydia or can you have some sort of a, a prevention, preventative? protocol met or guideline, which is a, a, a key question. Because the, the, the truth is we know that the prevalence of chlamydia or other STIs is very high in our city. So in that way, how do you roll out a prevention strategy? Or do you want some evidence to still confirm it? That, that's a key question for me. And this is where we struggle with how do you come up with some prevention strategy? Who is your target? How are you going to target it? And I think that work is still being formulated to say, is information going to help? Like, is going to these high schools, primary schools, sex education, teach these kids and tell them? Because you don't talk about infertility to them. All we have is contraception, contraception, contraception. But it's actually doing the other way. Can you talk to them openly about sexual and reproductive health, infertility, contraception? Then people are awake, and then they can do the right thing for themselves. Any questions for this?